Oral questions, questions oral, the honorable member for Durham. Mr. Speaker, the news of a pending GM closure is a very sad day for Oshawa, for Durham, and for all of Ontario. The men and women who work at GM Oshawa are some of the hardest working and best trained workers in the industry globally. We believe there's a future for manufacturing in Canada if we all work together and fight for it. What is the Prime Minister's plan to fight for these jobs in Oshawa? Yeah. Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we are disappointed by GM's decision regarding their plant in Oshawa as part of their global restructuring. Our thoughts are with those, uh, those whose jobs will be affected and their families. We understand today's news will have a significant impact on the whole community, as well as a network of suppliers who support all the plants impacted by GM's announcement. Our government will always stand with our auto workers and do everything we can to support them in these difficult times. Order. Order. The Honourable Member for Calgary Signal Hill has uh, already uh, commented quite a few times after, after during only one question. I'd ask him to remember the rule against interrupting. We may not like what we hear here, but we have to listen regardless. That's required. The Honourable Member for Durham. Mr. Speaker, the families in Oshawa near, need to hear that the Prime Minister hasn't already given up on a century of the auto industry in our community. We have the best workforce supported by suppliers across Ontario, and that ensures that we remain one of the best jurisdictions ready to build a car. We can't abandon this competitive advantage. We need to work on trade and regulatory barriers. Will the Prime Minister work with us on a plan to save these jobs in Oshawa? The Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, last night I spoke with the, C uh, the CEO and Chair of uh, GM, Mary Barra, to tell her how disappointed we were with this decision, uh, and this morning spoke with Premier Ford uh, to talk about how we were going to work together uh, to support the workers uh, in Oshawa and across the region uh, who are going to be affected by this decision. Uh, we will be working together on this one in a way that is uh, not political, because we know that being there to support the workers in this region is what people expect of all of their orders of government. Remember for Durham. Mr. Speaker, it's well known that steel and aluminum tariffs are impacting manufacturers across Ontario, including those in the auto industry. And now Canada's retaliatory tariffs are raising prices and leading to layoffs. Can the Prime Minister tell this House if General Motors spoke to his government about trade and tariff concerns impacting competitiveness in Canada? Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, uh, I uh, highlight that General Motors, like many uh, auto companies and many industries across Canada uh, and across the United States, were partners on us in negotiating uh, the uh, new NAFTA deal uh, in uh, holding uh, the trade between Canada and the United States as, uh, as firm and as protected as we possibly could. Uh, we also recognize that there is more work to do to eliminate the steel uh, and aluminum tariffs that are so unjustly imposed, uh, and that's why we continue to stand uh, with the work in the steel and aluminum industry and indeed in other industries uh, as we move forward to keep them safe. The Honourable Member for Mégantic Lérable. Mr. Speaker, a plant closure hurts. It hurts even more when the plant has been the heart of a region and the Canadian economy for more than a century. Today, more than 2,500 workers and their families learned that they have at most one year left working for GM in Oshawa. Mr. Speaker, these workers are the best in the industry. It's in their blood. We are with them during this terrible loss. Mr. Speaker, is the Prime Minister willing to stand with us and fight to save these jobs? The Right Honourable the Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we are disappointed in GM's decision in the frame of global restructuring. We know that the plant and families and workers will be affected by this closure, and we know that it will have an important impact on the network of suppliers for the plant as well as all of the region. Our government 
will always stand with our auto workers, and we will work as hard as necessary to help support them during this difficult time. The Honorable Member for Megantic Lerable, Mr. Speaker, the GM's announcement that it would be closing its Ottawa plant in December 2019 is terrible for workers, but also for the entire Canadian economy. What workers want to know is if their elected representatives are willing to fight to secure the future of the automobile industry in Canada. Mr. Speaker, we mustn't let up today because that would send an even more devastating message for the thousands, tens of thousands of jobs in the automobile industry. What is the Prime Minister's plan to guarantee the survival of the plant in Oshawa and the jobs of thousands of Canadians who have been working so hard to be the best in the industry? The Right Honourable the Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, obviously our thoughts are with the GM workers and their families. This morning I spoke with Premier Ford and we agreed that we would work together to help these workers. The automobile sector is solid and it is in a unique position to ensure the design and manufacture of cars for today and tomorrow. We have highly qualified workers. Canada and its auto industry workers are on the front lines of innovative technology and clean technology that is the future of this industry and we will always support our workers. The Honourable Member for Rimouski, Nejet, Temiskwata, Les Basques. Order. Apparently, there is a problem with the interpretation. Can you now hear it? Yes. I apologize. The honourable member can start again. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This week, Liberals gave corporations like General Motors 14 billion in various tax measures, supposedly because this would contribute to keep jobs in Canada. But today, while GM shareholders got a bump of 7 percent, more than 2,500 Canadian workers will lose their job and their livelihood. We can't afford billions in tax giveaways to these large companies when those same companies are pulling up stakes and leaving people out of work. The Prime Minister has expressed his disappointment, but what concrete actions is he planning to take for these workers and their families? Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, obviously our hearts go out to the uh, workers in the region affected, and we're going to be working with uh, the Government of Ontario to ensure that we're supporting those workers. But our support for the auto sector is a key part of our plan to create opportunities for Canadians. From day one, we have taken steps to make Canada's automotive manufacturing sector more globally competitive and innovative. We have announced over $5.6 billion in automotive sector investments in Canadian operations, creating and maintaining tens of thousands of good middle-class automotive jobs. As we look to the future, we're developing a plan that will focus on new initiatives. L'honorable député de Rimouski ne jette me squatter les basques. On another issue, Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister claims that he is progressive and feminist. Does he know that in 1981 there was a postal general strike that lasted for 41 days, but the government did not become involved? Does he know that after those 41 days, the parties came to an agreement, and for the first time in the history of the federal public service, collective bargaining resulted in maternity leave? That's what you get under free collective bargaining. Does the Prime Minister truly think today in this House that the Union could have made those historic gains if the government at the time had used a special bill like the one he has used and shoved down the throats of the employees on Friday. Mr. Speaker. On this side of the House, we truly believe in free and fair collective bargaining, and we think that the best agreements are reached at the bargaining table for approximately a year. We have been doing all we can to convince the two parties, parties to negotiate an agreement. We have reappointed the uh, a special arbitrator so that he can work for the next few days, and we encourage both parties to reach an agreement. Voting for that bill was not something that was taken lightly. The Honourable Member for Jean Pierre. Mr. Speaker, in 2011, when the Conservatives forced Canada Post employees to return to work, the Liberals were outraged. Now they're the ones imposing a spe special legislation. We know that postal workers are dealing with pay inequity, injuries, stress, and unpaid overtime. How can the Liberals, in all good conscience, tell themselves that they are the friends of workers while bringing in a bill to force Canada Post employees to go back to work? under those same conditions. The Right Honourable the Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, 
for three years, we have been working with unions to transform the relation between government and unions. It was broken by the previous Conservative government. We have always encouraged discussions at the bargaining table. We have always worked respectfully with unions. And obviously, there comes a time when we have to make difficult decisions. It was not an easy decision to take to go forward with this bill, but it was necessary for the Canadian economy to protect the Canadian economy and to move forward as a country. London Fanshawe. Mr. Speaker, Bill C-89 will force postal workers back into the toxic workplace they've been working to improve for over a year. Increased risks of workplace injury, forced overtime, stress and mental health issues, pay inequity. These are the real crises people are facing that need to be addressed. Ignoring them comes at a human and financial cost to the workers. Why are the Liberals so determined to force the workers back, knowing that they will be injured on the job? How can they not be ashamed of this? Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we have faith in the collective bargaining process and believe that the best deals are reached at the table. For nearly a year, we've been supporting and encouraging both sides to reach a negotiated agreement. We provided conciliation officers, appointed mediators, and offered voluntary arbitration. We continue to encourage both sides to reach a deal. Legislation is a step we did not take lightly. Honourable Member for Halliburton, Kawartha Lakes, Brock. Mr. Speaker, like thousands of General Motors employees and pensioners, we stand stunned at the news of the plant closure in Oshawa. This decision will wipe out a billion dollars in GDP and will ripple throughout the supply chain, putting tens of thousands of jobs at risk. For a century, GM workers have contributed to the economy of Southern Ontario and have bettered their community as coaches, volunteer firefighters and neighbourhood volunteers. We are not ready to give up. Speaker, what is the Prime Minister's plan to protect the future of the auto industry in Canada? Yeah, yeah. Minister of Innovation. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I want to take this opportunity to echo that I share the sentiments raised by the member opposite. This is absolutely devastating news uh, for Oshawa and the surrounding region. This has a significant impact on the workers and their families as well, and we as a government recognize that. I started my career in an automotive company as well, and I understand how important these jobs are to the local community as well. We've taken every step possible in the short term to reach, uh, reach out with uh, the unions, to speak with Jerry Diaz, to reach out and speak with the province. The Prime Minister has spoken with the Premier, and we'll continue to work with others to make sure we continue to defend auto workers in the auto sector. Honourable Member for Niagara West. Mr. Speaker, it's a difficult time in Oshawa today. Our thoughts are with the GM workers and their families. Osh Oshawa is devastated. The Prime Minister needs to put a plan in place immediately. Full effort should be made to support Canadian workers and their families at this very difficult time. When will the Prime Minister release a plan for the auto workers in Oshawa? Right, the Honourable Minister of Innovation. Uh, Mr. Speaker, obviously this is a very difficult time uh, for the workers uh, and for their families as well. This is very difficult uh, for the local community. I spoke with uh, the mayor, local mayor, uh, Mayor Henry as well, to talk about what this means to the community and to say very clearly we're there to support the community, to support the workers and to support the automotive sector. This has been a priority for our government since we formed government. Since 2015, we've seen $5.6 billion worth of investments in the automotive sector, and we'll continue to work with the community in Oshawa and the surrounding regions to make sure they have a path forward. Honourable Member for Central Okanagan, Milkamine Nicola. Mr. Speaker, it isn't just the GM plant in Oshawa that's closed under this Prime Minister's watch. General Electric in Peterborough closed, 358 jobs gone. Campbell Soups in Toronto closed, 380 jobs gone. Procter & Gamble in Brockville closed, 500 jobs gone. Does the Prime Minister recognize that there is a crisis and we need a plan to stop more job losses? The Honourable Minister of Innovation. Mr. Speaker, again, we understand how difficult this is for the workers, not only in Oshawa, but the suppliers that are impacted in so many other communities within the surrounding region as well. That is why in the fall economic update by the Minister of Finance, we put forward measures to clearly demonstrate a plan to build on our previous budget submissions around innovation and skills, where we're making sure that we bring in more investments through changes through our tax code and tax policy. These are measures that really help the Canadian economy. We've seen tremendous growth in the economy, 3% in GDP. GDP and 500,000 jobs have been created, but we have more to do, Mr. Speaker, and we endeavor to do more. 
Honourable Member for Central Okanagan's Milkamine Nicolet. Mr. Speaker, Grenville Castings in Perth closed, 380 jobs gone. A Dixie Cup plant in Brampton closed, 133 jobs gone. Oreo cookie plant in Montreal closed, 454 jobs gone. A carpet manufacturing plant in Waterloo closed, 256 jobs gone. Mr. Speaker, this is a crisis. Where is our Prime Minister's plan to stop more of these job losses? The Honourable Minister of Innovation. We have a record low unemployment rate, the lowest in the last 40 years. We've seen tremendous job growth overall take place in the economy. Clearly, there are regions and communities that are going through difficult challenges. Today, GM announced significant job losses in Oshawa. We understand how difficult this is for the workers and for their families. That is why we reached out to the local leadership there in the unions. That is why we reached out to the local mayor. We're also engaged the province as well. We'll continue to work with the community and make sure we help them going forward to make sure that we continue to defend auto workers in the auto sector. A member for Carleton. When I asked the government uh, why it was exempting large industrial corporations from its carbon tax, the reason it gave was that if the tax applied, many of those companies would leave and the jobs would go with them. And they were right about that. But now we have crises of uh, layoffs in the energy and now auto sector. Uh, if the government will not agree with us to scrap the carbon tax altogether, will they at least agree to put it on hold while we figure out what to do about this terrible jobs crisis? Honourable Minister of Innovation. Speaker, since we formed government in 2015, and let's talk about the automotive sector, we've used the Automotive Innovation Fund and ultimately we changed it to the Strategic Innovation Fund. This is a, a $2 billion fund that has helped bring forward many investments in Canada, specifically in the automotive sector. The 37 projects that we've put forward have leveraged $4.1 billion of investments in the automotive sector, and overall the sector has contributed $5.6 billion since 2015. This has helped create and maintain thousands of jobs, Mr. Speaker, and we'll continue to work harder to make sure we protect these jobs. The Honourable Member for Carleton. Well, nobody is uh, saying that the government isn't spending enough money. They're spending money everywhere. Their deficit is three times what they promised. But this carbon tax will make it more expensive for businesses to operate, to heat their plants, to power their machinery, to transport their goods. These are costs that other countries do not face because they don't have a carbon tax. The government admits that carbon taxes drive jobs out of the country. So with that admission, why don't they agree to put this tax on hold until we can figure out what to do about this crisis? Honourable Minister of Innovation. Let's talk about some investments and jobs with regards to the Strategic Innovation Fund. This is a fund that we also announced additional funding for in the fall economic update. This is a $2 billion fund. Uh, Advantech Wireless, 95 jobs. Blue Solutions, 246 jobs. CAE, 4,300 jobs. Encore, 4,000 jobs. General Fusion, 170 jobs. Linamar, 9,500 jobs. Mr. Speaker, these are clear examples of the government being a meaningful partner to help create conditions for more jobs in the Canadian economy. Honorable Deputy de Jean Pierre. The Honorable Member for Jean Pierre. The GM plant closure in Oshawa is devastating news for the working men and women of the plant. For every direct job, there are approximately seven indirect jobs that are essential to the local economy. More than 5,000 Canadian families could be affected by these layoffs. The NDP was right in calling for a national auto strategy. GM decided to take the green shift, but clearly our automobile sector is not ready to adapt. Why did the government ignore the future of the auto sector? Where are the concrete measures to modernize the industry and keep good jobs. The Honourable Minister of Innovation, Mr. Speaker, I am very disappointed in the decision that was taken today by GM. My thoughts are with the workers, their families and their communities, all those who are affected by the announcement. I understood that this decision was taken in the context of global restructuring that will affect their operations and their states in the U.S. and Europe as well. These are, this is terrible news, and I understand the feelings of the workers and their families. In Mountain. Mr. Speaker, last week the Liberals gave companies like General Motors $14 billion in tax giveaways saying it would protect jobs here in Canada. 
Less than five days later, GM announces its plan to close its Oshawa plant, shattering the lives of more than 5,000 families with the ripple effect. This is devastating for the Canadians who have mortgages and kids in school. The Liberals must step in and do whatever it takes to protect these jobs. Mm -hmm. Will the Liberal government invest in hybrid and electric car manufacturing as part of a national auto strategy? What is the government plan to save these jobs? Bravo! Honourable Minister of Innovation. Mr. Speaker, we know again this is a very difficult time uh, for the workers in Oshawa and in the surrounding region as well that have been told that these jobs are being eliminated. That is why we're going to work with the local municipal leadership, with the province, the unions, to put forward a plan to really assist these workers as they're going, as they're going through this transition. But in the meantime, we have put measures in place that have secured additional jobs, particularly in the automotive sector. $5.6 billion worth of investments have been made in the automotive sector since 2015, largely due to our measures around the Strategic Innovation Fund. We'll continue to support the auto workers, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Richmond, North Alaska. Mr. Speaker, for over a week, 10 days exactly, the Prime Minister and the Minister of Official Languages have been using official languages for partisan purposes with the sole intent of making political games. Unfortunately, that is not the right attitude to take towards official language communities in the country. And I would say that at this time it especially affects francophones in Ontario. The government has to end this harmful approach and find a solution because there are clearly solutions. So my question to the Minister of Official Languages is what is their intention to do concretely to support all Franco-Ontarians today? The Minister of Official Languages. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We have no lessons to learn from the Conservatives. The reality is that we have invested billions of dollars in official languages, the biggest investment in the history, $500 million of new money. I had the opportunity last week to announce the Court Challenges program. This is a program that is necessary to defend language rights. And this program was abolished by the previous Harper government. And now it's going to be very useful for all Francophones who want to be able to defend their rights and defend their rights, especially because of the injustices committed in Ontario. The Honourable Member for Richmond, Arthabasca. Mr. Speaker, it truly is incredible to see how the Minister plays petty political games. This program was stopped in March 2017. It took 20 months for the minister to reactivate it. For two months, the infrastructure bank has existed, and you still can't get services in French from them. So she should stop trying to teach lessons to everyone else. Our question is simple. Franco-Ontarians are waiting for concrete actions, not just words. So what does she plan on doing concretely to support them? The Minister of Official Languages, Mr. Speaker, I would like to paint a more accurate picture. Why do you think Francophones have been waiting for action? Well, the injustices were created by the Ford government and the leader of the uh, official opposition was about the only one who didn't condemn what happened in Ontario. So the reality is that there is a common front amongst Franco-Ontarians, Acadians, Quebecers, and Canadians as a whole that want the leader of the opposition to recognize at least one thing, and that is that an injustice has been done to Franco-Ontarians. The Honourable Member for Beauport-Limoilou, Mr. Speaker, the Minister should stop misleading this House. The Prime Minister confirmed earlier that he spoke with the Premier of Ontario with respect to a very important issue, that is, the GM workers. So, after having played partisan games on the backs of Franco-Ontarians, did he at least raise that issue over the telephone with the Premier of Ontario? The Right Honourable the Prime Minister. Yes, Mr. Speaker, I did. I made it very clear that I support francophone minority communities throughout the country and I will continue to actively stand up for them contrary to the leader of the opposition. I'll continue to support francophone communities throughout the country. Order. Order, please. 
Order. The Honourable Member for Beauport, Côte de Beaupré, Lorient, Charlevoix. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm pleased to see that we all want to stand up for Franco-Ontarians in this House. Mr. Speaker, we have to stop playing partisan games in this House now on the backs of Franco-Ontarians. The Leader of the Official Opposition, Mr. Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition, Official Opposition, this morning sent a letter to the Prime Minister to hold an urgent meeting to speak about this file. Will the Prime Minister accept that hand that is being extended or not? Order. The Honourable Minister of the Official Languages. Mr. Speaker, it's been 11 days since that famous Black Thursday. 11 days for the Leader of the Opposition to start considering the issue. Now, what I want to tell you and what I want to tell all Francophones throughout the country, whether they be Franco-Ontarians or whether they be Quebecers or Francophones in Saskatchewan or Acadians, any of those official language minority communities, I want to tell them that they can count on our government. We are here to stand up for their rights. Hello, The Honourable Member for saint hyacinthe Bagot, Mr. Speaker, with last week's economic update, we can clearly see what this government's priorities are. They've been giving tax credits to major corporations. Well, every year there are Canadians who are con having a hard time paying for their medication. This is unconscionable, especially given that the PBO showed that Pharmacare would save money. When will the government take concrete action at for families and all Canadians and bring in Pharmacare. The Honourable Minister of Health, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, Canadians are proud of their health care system, which depends on the ability to fare, but we know we can do better. So this is why we've introduced an advisory committee on uh, medication insurance. They will begin their work in 2019. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Last week, the, the Liberals gave $14 billion in tax breaks to rich corporations and left families struggling to make ends meet. Now Canadians and Canadian businesses are continuing to spend billions on medication for themselves or their employees. A universal single-payer pharmacare system would save Canadians and small businesses billions of dollars, but the Liberals chose to invest in the 1% instead of helping those in need. Mr. Speaker, will the Liberals help people by implementing a universal single-payer pharmacare system, or will they keep giving handouts to the richest corporations? Honourable Minister of Health. Mr. Speaker, Canadians are proud of their publicly funded health care system, one that's based on need and not on their ability to pay. But we also recognize that we can do better. Canadians should not have to choose between paying for medication or putting food on the table. That is why that in Budget 2018, I was proud that we launched the Advisory Council on the Implementation of a National Pharmacare Program. The committee has been having a national dialogue with Canadians, and I look forward to receiving their report in spring of 2019. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member for Scarborough Agent Court. Mr. Speaker, I am proud to be part of a government that recognizes the many contributions that seniors have made to this country. Seniors have worked their entire life and have added so much to our communities and economy and should be able to retire with security and dignity. Could the Minister of Seniors please update this House on the steps that our government is taking to tackle the important issue of pension security? The Minister of Seniors. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the Honourable Colleague from Scarborough Agent Court for her question. Pension security is important to our government, and that's why I'm very pleased last week to have announced with the Minister of Innovation that we have taken the next step on consultations and have opened up our consultations nationally. Mr. Speaker, our government wants a balanced and evidence-based solution to this problem. We don't want a Band-Aid solution that has unintended consequences on our pensioners, and that's why these consultations are so important. I encourage all those who wish to offer input to do so. And, Mr. Speaker, we know this is a decades-old problem, and we're going to get this right. Honourable Member for Aurora Oak Ridges, Richmond Hill.
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Documents submitted in the Admiral Norman case are revealing discrepancies of deep concern. In October, the President of the Treasury Board stood in this House and claimed he was just doing his job when he politically interfered in the supply ship contract. But in 2016, interview with the RCMP, the Minister said, quote, this wasn't his role. Which is it, Mr. Speaker? Is the President of the Treasury Board misleading the RCMP? Or Canadians. Yeah. Minister of Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, uh, as we have explained in this House uh, many times in the past, this is a matter that is presently before the courts. Uh, the courts are adjudicating on all of the facts. They will determine those facts according to law and make a, a decision in due course. And that's where the case is tried, Mr. Speaker, in court, not in the House of Commons. Mr. Speaker, the fact is there are things that have been made public. Documents tell us that the President of Treasury Board had in his possession a letter from Irving Shipyards that neither the Minister of National Defence nor Public Works had. But the minister is saying it's not his problem. Then he's saying he's going to deal with it. So who's mistaken, the House or the RCMP? Uh, Mr. Speaker, the, uh, the facts of the case will be determined by the judge in the trial. That's where our system works, Mr. Speaker. Well, member for Calgary, Midnapore. Mr. Speaker, the Liberal Member of Parliament for Brampton East resigned last week, citing personal reasons, but over the weekend, the PMO's official story has changed several times. And every time it has changed, the details have become more concerning. It was finally revealed that the RCMP is investigating. Can the Prime Minister confirm that his office has waived privilege and is assisting the RCMP in their investigation? Honourable Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, as was mentioned last week, the member told us that he's undergoing certain challenges and that he is receiving treatment from a health professional. We hope he receives the support that he needs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member for Thornhill. Mr. Speaker, Vice Admiral Norman's defence team say court documents ordered release Friday reveal contradictions between statements made by the President of the Treasury Board and other witnesses, including fellow ministers. And Admiral Norman's lawyer points to the RCMP witness list, arguing it indicates the investigation has been politicized. We also know the RCMP has been investigating the source of gambling funds spent by the member for Brampton East, who resigned Thursday. Mr. Speaker, can the Prime Minister tell us just how many other Liberals are being investigated by the RCMP? The Honourable Minister of Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, the, uh, it, with respect to the, uh, uh, the Norman case, the, uh, uh, the Honourable Gentleman uh, makes certain allegations. Um, there are, of course, procedures in our country for handling such, uh, such allegations. It's called the court system. Charges have been laid. The defence has the opportunity to make a full response. All the facts will be, will be uh, uh, reviewed and, and exposed in court, Mr. Speaker, and in due course, the court will take a decision. That's how our justice system works. The Honourable Member for Drummond. Mr. Speaker. Federal and provincial official language ministers have been blaming each other all a week, all last week, with respect to protecting French in Ontario. But both are responsible. Francophones need more than ministers who are not shouldering their responsibilities. The federal department and the prime minister must protect Francophones in Ontario and all over the country. Will the Prime Minister have an emergency meeting with the Premier of Ontario in order that there can be a Francophone University in Ontario? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, we will always work with provinces and others in order to protect Francophones countrywide. We want a collaborative approach, but the reality of what's happening in Ontario means that we ha had to decry an injustice did it, the NDP did it, the Bloc did it, the Independents did it, one party didn't. Because... Uh, Months worrisome allegations were being raised about the conduct of the Liberal MP from Brampton East. 
the Prime Minister issued a statement citing serious personal challenges, significant gambling debts, potential and serious conflicts of interest. Now an investigation by our own Ethics Commissioner, as well as an investigation by the RCMP and FinTrack raise even more serious questions. Canadians want to know the answer to one very important question from the Prime Minister, and only he is fit to answer it. When did the Prime Minister first know of these serious allegations, and what did he do about it? The Honourable Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, as has clearly been stated, it was last week that the member told us that he is undergoing certain challenges and that he is receiving the treatment from a health professional. We really do hope that he receives the support and assistance that he needs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member for Edmonton Manning. Mr. Speaker, this weekend we learned that the Liberals spent $500,000 to develop a marketing brand for the federal government's rural poverty reduction initiative. I'm not just making this up. $500,000 would do a long way to, to help save lives and protect the vulnerable in the developing world. Instead, the Liberals thought a marketing plan was a better way to spend this money. The Liberals should be ashamed of themselves. How can the Minister justify this outrageous cost? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of International Development. Mr. Speaker, our government takes the use of taxpayers' money very seriously. The Minister spoke directly to the Managing Director of FinDev Canada this morning to express this concern. As a brand new institution, Mr. Speaker, some startup costs are expected, but the amount spent in this case is clearly excessive. The rules and standards also apply to Crown Corporations like FinDev Canada, and we're counting on the Crown Corporation's leaders to ensure responsible management of public funds. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Portneuf, Jacques Cartier. It just goes on and on, Mr. Speaker. The Liberal government has been spending hand over fist. We learned this morning that a federal agency created to deal with poverty is spending $500,000 for a name, a logo, and a trademark. What would the government say to the poor who have not been able to afford breakfast this morning? When will this government honour its commitments instead of spending all that money on its image? Mr. Speaker, as I've said, Mr. Speaker, FinDev Canada is one of our new international aid financing tools designed to raise private capital and generate investment in developing countries. Ultimately, FinDev Canada will gener generate investments that will have a real impact on the poorest and the most vulnerable, including women and girls around the world, Mr. Speaker. As a brand new institution, some sp startup costs are expected, but the amount spent in this case is clearly excessive, Mr. Speaker, and we're counting on the Crown Corporation's leaders to ensure response management of public funds. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member for Selkirk, Interlake, Eastman Order. Mr. Speaker, this weekend, Russia violated international law again by attacking and seizing three Ukrainian ships. Russia continues to escalate tensions in the region by invading Ukraine, launching multiple cyber attacks, and threatening free and fair elections around the world. This government needs to realize that Putin is provoked by weakness and we must make Ukraine stronger. Will the Liberals finally give Ukraine the lethal weapons it needs and sanction all the Russian crooks who are violating our international peace, safety and security? The Minister of Foreign Affairs. Mr. Speaker, let me be very clear. Canada strongly condemns Russian aggression towards Ukraine in the Kerch Strait, and we call on Russia to immediately release the captured Ukrainian crew and vessels. Yesterday, I spoke on the phone late last night with Ukraine's Foreign Minister, Pavlo Klimkin, and assured him of Canada's strong support. I've been directly in touch with Jeremy Hunt, the Foreign Secretary of the UK, and Federica Mogherini, the High Representative of the European Union. We're working closely with our allies. We strongly support Operation Unifier, and we are in close touch with Ukraine. Yeah, yeah. Well, member for Whitby. Mr. Speaker, in my town of Whitby and Oshawa and Durham region as a whole, there are many who are feeling the effect of today's announcement by GM. The auto workers and families who live in the region are a critical part of our community and economy. Mr. Speaker, they are friends and neighbours, and I want to assure them that we are here for them during this very difficult time. Mr. Speaker, can the Minister please share with the House what our government will be doing to help the workers and their families impacted by GM's decision today? The Honourable Minister of Innovation. 
Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank my colleague from Whitby for her advocacy and her hard work in really defending her community and defending the automotive sector. As she's highlighted, this is devastating news. This is very difficult uh, for the community. And of course, our, our hearts go out to the workers as well. We have been very clear that we're going to defend the automotive sector. We have put measures in place to do so. The Strategic Innovation Fund is one such example. And we're going to work with the province and the unions on a path forward to make sure we defend the automotive automotive sector and the automotive workers. Honourable Member for Red Deer Lacombe. Mr. Speaker, the Liberals have admitted on multiple occasions that Russia has interfered in the last federal election, but they've refused to give any details to Canadians. Canadian elections belong to Canadians, and we have a right to know how our elections have been influenced by foreign entities. But instead of being transparent and open, the Liberals refuse to say how the Russians manipulated the last election. Why won't the Prime Minister come clean with Canadians and take foreign influence in our elections seriously? The Minister of Democratic Institutions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And as my honourable colleague knows, foreign interference in our elections is absolutely we do not support it at all. And this is something that all colleagues in our House, all colleagues in this House should get together on to ensure that we are not politicizing this issue. In fact, Bill C-76 has important measures in place to ensure that we are not enabling foreign funding of our, in, in any event in advertising for our elections, that we are ensuring that we are protecting the integrity of our elections. And this is something, Mr. Speaker, that is above partisanship, and we are working hard with all of our national security agencies to ensure the Honourable Member for Trois-Rivières, Mr. Speaker, more than two months ago, I asked the Minister of, of Innovation to say when there would be a solution to getting victims of pyrotite out of the grey zone, i.e. a scientific study. His office informed me that there would be an agreement signed, a protocol of research signed very soon. Can the minister say where things stand with respect to the signature and the length of the study? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank my colleague for his question. My government recognizes just how important it is to be careful in, build in new buildings in Canada. We are partnering with the University of Laval in a study, this collaboration with researchers will find a limit just how high, how much silver can be uh, in building materials. International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women. November 25th also marks the beginning of the 16 days of activism against gender-based violence. Les statistiques montrent que the statistics show that women and girls are more at risk of being victims of violence than are men and boys. We know that every six days, a woman in Canada is killed by her intimate partner. Of status of women give us ideas of ways we could all get involved in the efforts to end gender-based violence once and for all. Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, thanks to the courage of silence breakers, we now understand more than ever that gender-based violence hurts families, individuals, and it scars for life. It also costs our economy, Mr. Speaker. $12 billion a year is what d domestic violence alone costs our Canadian communities. Our government's introduced over $200 million in investments to address and prevent gender-based violence. We kicked off 16 days of activism with a partnership with CFL to show that men are part of the solution. Over the next few days, we'll be announcing investments on addressing campus violence and also, Mr. Speaker, ensuring that communities are supported through org the Honourable Member for the Villa Pignier. Mr. Speaker, the government's approach with respect to the third link seems extremely timid or even non existent. Members for the Wee Bag and Quebec are, it seems, not up to the task of defending these regional files. The third link would allow for economic expansion without precedent in uh, the greater Quebec area. Mr. Speaker, when will the Liberal government show leadership and support this promising project that is the third link between Davy and Quebec? When? The Honourable Minister for Infrastructure, 
Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the Honourable Member for Lutbinier for his theat uh, theatrical talent. But last week, Mr. Speaker, in consultation with the members for Louisbourg and the member for Quebec, we discussed the 287 infrastructure projects that are underway in this in Quebec City. We will continue to invest in public transit. And when a project comes up for the third link, we will look look at it with interest. The Honourable Member for the Politini. Mr. Speaker, don't look for any transition to a green economy in the economic update. Once again, they're subsidizing big oil rather than green uh, transit. It's hardly a surprise. According to Oil Change International, Ottawa has invested $62 billion in fossil fuels. $62 billion compared to $5 billion in clean energy. It's as if the Conservatives were still in power. When will the federal government stop wasting Quebecers' money on businesses that accelerate climate change? The Honourable uh, the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. The economic st uh, statement included specific measures to encourage manufacturers to invest in clean equipment, among other things. Mr. Speaker, I would never compare our record in shame to the Conservatives, who after 10 years only were able to re achieve a reduction in emissions by shrinking the economy. Mr. Speaker, we are investing in public transit. We are putting a price on pollution. We are investing in the clean economy. I couldn't be more proud to be part of this government because we're finally taking the environment seriously while we grow the economy at the same time. The Honourable Member for the Pontigny, the economy, energy should not be coming from fossil fuel. If the government does not uh, transition to a green economy, I, it's the young people who will have to, to pay for it. This is why Environnement Jeunesse is uh, making a class action suit against Ottawa because it has betrayed its commitments to fight climate change. That's where we are now. Is it really necessary for the government to be dragged into court by young people in order to stop subsidizing big oil? Merci, uh, ma collègue de... Mr. Speaker, I thank my colleague for Repentigny. We've made historic investments in infrastructure, more than $80 billion so far. But we have invested $30 billion in public transit and $20 billion in uh, uh, the transition to a green economy. We want an economy that is modern, resilient and green. That's what we want for Canadians. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question to the Prime Minister is this. On Sunday, December 2nd, the 24th Conference of the Parties on the Climate Convention will convene in Poland. The report of the IPCC on the imperative that the planet hold to 1.5 degrees C and not above it in global average temperature is on that agenda. Will Canada lead and commit to improving our plan such that we are on a pathway to 1.5 and help lead the world there? The right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I thank my colleague for her dedication and her passion on the environment, environmental file. Let us face the facts. Climate change is real. Climate change is man-made. We must act to fight it. That's why we are working hard to meet our 2030 targets, knowing there will be more work to do after that. After a decade of international abandonment on the environmental file under the Conservatives, Canada has returned as a leader at COP. We will continue to tackle climate change, both at home and abroad. Excellent. Hello, 